pajamas on. There we go. We are live. All right, folks. My name is Tim Black. I think we should be live at this point. Welcome back to the Tim Black Show. Glad to have you guys here with me. I got a special guest today. He is an American political activist. He's a cool brother. Uh, in 2016, he ran as vice president on the Green Party ticket. They were in 45 states. They were doing the thing. They got 1.4 million votes. He serves as a national organizer and spokesperson for the Black Alliance for Peace and a, gr a great organization. My brother and your brother, brother Ajamu Baraka. Hey, how you doing, man? Brother Tim, brother Tim, I'm glad to be back here. Been a little while, but it's always a pleasure to get a chance to chop it up with you and your and your audience. Yeah, man, um, a, a lot's happened, man. That's why you've been, you know, I, I did a re, uh, audience revamp, right? So it took a couple years for me to kind of get an audience that uh, I wasn't beholden to in ways that I was uncomfortable with. Mm. And, and now I'm back, brother. I, I feel amazing, bro. I got it going on. So you, you, man, um, I, I, I noticed a lot. I, I pulled some questions from your Twitter, and um, hopefully we can talk about them and just chop it up, man. Okay, sounds good. Sounds good. I, I gotta start. I gotta start with my brother Cornell West, man. Doctor Cornell West. Gotta put the doctor on you. I don't want to be like some people and take away all his degrees. Um, right, right. How do you feel about the Doctor West campaign? What was your first initial response when you heard that he was running? Because you had to be surprised, like I was. Well, I actually wasn't. I was surprised when he first uh, announced that he was running and running with the People's Party. Uh, but as some of your audience may know. Uh, he made a transition, and um, I was part of that conversation uh, that that assisted with that transition. He wasn't uh, comfortable uh, with the party, um, and so there was a conversation uh, that was organized by uh, Chris Hedges, that included myself and Jill Stein, and both Dr. West and his his wife was very much involved in, in the campaign. Uh, we talked about the pros and cons of, of running with, with the Green Party. Uh, and that was part of, of that process. So yes, I'm, so I wasn't surprised. It was something that was percolating. Um, and it, um, I think is a very uh, important um, event. You know, it is, Tim, there's, there's not much in, in this current environment where it's quite clear that the uh, neoliberals that control the U.S. state are committed to uh, eliminating all political opposition. Therefore, the the result has been a serious sort of uh, uh, constricting of the areas of legitimate uh, discourse, uh, even to the point where not only have they restricted uh, what can be talked about using their relationship with Silicon Valley. They have been able to attempt to impose sort of an, sort of an ideological uh, conformity on the population where certain kinds of, of, of information would not be allowed to uh, fully circulate. If you take positions that are contrary to the uh, official state line, uh, not only do you face the possibility of being uh, censored, uh, in the case, for example, of the uh, African People's Socialist Party and the Uhuru, Uhuru movement, you may be criminalized. So this is a very dangerous environment that's, that's been created and created primarily not by the Trumpian forces. We didn't talk about this. But as you know, I've been making an argument, a very strong argument for the last you know, six years or so uh, or more that in my opinion, the cutting edge of a new form of US, US fascism is coming not so necessarily from the Trumpian forces as dangerous as some of them are, but from this uh, neoliberal element of the, of the ruling class. So because of the, the, the narrow discourse that has been normalized in this country, the only uh, quasi pro worker kind of, of of considerations in terms of policy has come from the liberal wing of the Democrat Party, but the liberal wing of the Democrat Party, the so called progressives, they have completely delegitimized themselves uh, by surrendering 
of their positions to the to the party elite. So there's no discussions around the objective plight of working class people and poor people. So enter the possibility of a Cornell West. Well, Cornell West's campaign provides an opportunity, we think, to raise some serious questions about uh, the future of, of this country and really uh, collective humanity, if you will, because of the role uh, that the U.S. plays collect in, 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 in terms of global politics and global economics. So the kind of critical uh, discourse that this campaign can generate and has already generated, it is it's going to help to expand the range of what is legitimate discourse, the kinds of questions that we can we can raise, the the possibility of people making connections they need to make in order for them to understand what really is in play regarding these contrasting, conflicting interests. So I think overall, no matter what may happen uh, within the context of U.S. politics, uh, the Cornell West campaign, I think, has to be seen as a positive. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I, I mean, let me just clarify. I didn't want to cut you off, but I wasn't referring to the actual uh, him. Just I didn't, I didn't think he just automatically became a Green Party running in, under the Green Party. I'm sure that there were checks and balances. I know he met with Chris Hedges and Jill Stein, Dr. Jill Stein. I didn't know that that included you, but I meant I was stunned that he decided to go the political route. Oh, um, okay. Yeah. yeah, that's that's what I meant because, you know, there's a lot, you know, I'm, I'm a follower of uh, the late, great Glenn Ford, and it's kind of anti-typical to what, like a revolutionary, because the system is so corrupt, Ajama, is what I meant. I, that's what I'm kind of getting. The system is so corrupt um, that um, it just seems like it's such a, such an uphill battle when you, you got so many forces that are at play against you, which you just, you just outlined perfectly, which leads me to another, another point, brother, that I wanted to mention was, um, but let me say this before you go to the next point in sure. terms of, of your alignment with Glenn. And as you know, um, Glenn was a close personal friend of mine. And yes. of course I also wrote for the black agenda report, still write for it. I'm on the editorial board now. Right. Glenn was not someone that was opposed to, Participate. I'm not saying you're saying this. Glenn had an understanding of the the role of the of bourgeois politics and the role of the electoral arena in terms of how that can be utilized potentially to advance certain ideals, uh, perspectives, analysis. Um, of course, he was deaf on the, the Democratic Party uh, and the uh, neoliberals and the uh, so-called black misleadership class. Those neo-colonial uh, professional administrative, I call Uncle Toms, uh, that are running most of these urban areas where you have uh, significant uh, populations of Black folks. Okay, and but he was always open, as many of us were, because before 2016, brother, I I didn't really deal with this uh, electoral process except I understood that it had some potentiality. I also understood too that I was not going to take an elitist position. To say that uh, we should not contest in it where millions of Black people and millions of, of working class people were, in fact, participating in it, not just on the national level, but on the state and local levels. To me, it's always been a strategic question as opposed to a question of principles. Okay. Now, even in terms of principles, because I'm a believer in democracy and I support authentic democracy uh, for myself. I never participated in the so-called democratic process in the U.S. The first time that I voted in 2016, I voted for myself. So um, that's just a, a matter of my position. So, you know, so I just want to make sure that, that your audience understands that that these are questions that have to be thought through. They're questions that really depend on the particular historical moment as to whether or not you participate and how, in fact, you participate. Very interesting. And as you describe it, I, I think some people envision that we get to moments like uh, simultaneously, spontaneously, they just happen. But I believe your run, you and Dr. Jill's run in 2016, is what leads us here. I think that's part of the evolution of, of, that, of that, that choice that you guys made to step out and do that. Uh, and, and make that a reality. You know, some people have made the criticism that 
Dr. West's campaign is that serious. And based on your statements, I think I understand where you're coming from that, but what would you say to that? What, how do they define serious? It's my thought. It's just, it's propaganda. They're, they're basically, not only do they know it's serious, they see it as a threat. Look at the number of, of hit articles that have come out uh, since Dr. West announced he was going to uh, seek the nomination of the Green Party. And I'm not talking about just alternative press, as important as that can be. I'm talking about uh, pieces from the Atlantic Magazine and the New York Times and 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 all of these major mainstream uh, cooperations that have raised the issue of the the threat that a uh, e effective West campaign poses uh, to the Democrat Party. See, they don't want anybody to 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 emerge who could. Uh, upset the the relationship primarily between the Democrat Party and the the most loyal constituency and the one that they take the most advantage of and that is black folks they believe that those votes uh, belong to them meaning the Democrat Party and therefore they can just uh tout just parade out uh, some of these uncle time leaders uh and and with some vague uh promises uh, for certain kind of policies and, you know, uh, a vague reference to reparations or or some other kind of uh, BS. Uh, and that was enough to keep uh, Black folks in the in the Democrat Party uh, pocket. Well, you know, we've always understood that that vote can be uh, can be up to uh, a contention. Uh, and they see the Dr. West candidacy potentially as something that could really uh, pose as a real threat. because. You know, the kinds of issues that that we face, African people, black people face in the U.S. as working class people, as colonized people, um, require certain kinds of political responses, responses that the Democrat Party is not prepared to engage in. And so this kind of expanded discourse, potentially, as I talked about, uh, poses a real threat to them. So, so, so what do you do? You pretend like it's not really serious. I don't know what the evidence is on that. Because they are building out a campaign, a campaign structure. Uh, they are now trying to raise resources because you have to have resources in this country to participate uh, in the electoral process. Uh, they got uh, uh, activists in the Green Party who have experience uh, in national campaigns, and they are behind uh, the efforts to get uh, the campaign on the various ballots across the country. It is a most serious. Uh, campaign, and I think that is the the issue for for some elements. When you talk about working class people as black folks, brings to mind that conversation or uh, the back and forth, the actual arguments about class and race, and what Dr. West's campaign should and should not mention while he's on the campaign trail. What are your thoughts about this class race debate? That if he's a serious campaign, he can't be talking about race because it's unpalatable to the masses of white folks who are soft bigots, in my opinion, or do you go into that and knowing that and you still do it? What, what do you think? I haven't seen any evidence that, that, that Cornell West would uh, uh, negate his uh, almost 50 years of activism and agitation, uh, helping people to understand this link between race and class, that he has turned his back for uh, opportunistic reasons on that kind of correct perspective. If he wasn't prepared to engage the, the, the public in that kind of conversation, then the question would become, why is he running? And, and, and so we know it ain't about no vanity thing necessarily. It is about um, the historical moment and the need to raise these issues. Part of the issue with the Sanders uh, campaign was they didn't understand that link between class and race, it appeared. Um, and so in their discourse, it almost got to a point where it seemed like the working class was really just the white working class. Well, we understand that, you know, nine, over 90 percent of black folks in the U.S. are in the working class. So, you know, you can't disconnect the issue of, of class or race. Now, you have some people who call themselves leftists who make the argument that if you raise a certain kind of uh, issues related to race that's divisive to the working class, well, we consider that to be nonsense. 
that basically an issue that you face is you don't understand white supremacy. And you yourself have not purged yourself of your own white supremacist perspectives and ideologies. And therefore you don't know how to deal with that issue. In fact, it makes you uncomfortable. Well, we don't have the luxury of, 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 of playing with this issue because there's a reason why black people, even in the working class, uh, find themselves in certain, in certain levels of the working class. We find ourselves at the bottom rungs of the working class. And as a consequence of both our class uh, position and the issue of race, okay? So we clear about that and prepare to make the arguments for people to understand that and understand that until white workers understand that connection, until white workers are prepared to stand in solidarity with black workers, that basically we're going to always have the potential of, of working class struggles being divided because they're already divided. So how do you deal with the division? You confront the division, okay? You build solidarity. You can't build solidarity by pretending that this thing doesn't exist. Yes, yes. And the major pushback that I've seen hasn't been from black folks saying that Dr. West doesn't mention race or he's not, you know, he's not standing on 10 toes down on his racial bona fides that he's been talking about for the last 40, 50 years. It's been the other ways you describe with the progressives that are saying, if you really want a real program, if you want a real campaign, you can't mention it. And that's sort of like the thing I've been, when we started off the conversation, when I said they had to like rebuild my audience, I had to get some of those people out because frankly, as much as I try to educate them, maybe I needed a Jamo there <laughs> with me last couple of years to like educate them that, now when I talk about black issues, that's supposed to be relevant. To, uh, to the conversation because uh, those are also class issues that you should care about. Exactly. You see, yeah, so um, I noticed the tweet you put out. You may you may know I interviewed um, new campaign manager Peter Dow, and yeah. um, you put a tweet out. Now, I want to see if this is in regards to that. You said, today's radicals were yesterday's liberals. Have some humility, folks. Critical analysis is good. Petty bourgeois, know-it-allism, and arrogance informed by being a radical for two weeks is dangerous and not welcome. I thought that was an amazing tweet, brother. Was that in regards to the, the dust-up about Peter Dow being the campaign manager or just in general? Well, I mean, of course, you know, we, you respond to things that are happening in, in current time. And so there was some, some, some connections. But is a, is a, is, is, it was in general also because there is this tendency among uh, new radicals uh, who have been liberals for most of their lives, who now finally, who finally woke up and saw uh, the contradictions and were honest enough to see the contradictions and courageous enough to, to go forward, uh, that then they get self-righteous. And I'm just suggesting to them, remember when you uh, cry when uh, Barack Obama was was elected, okay? All right. <laughs> you know, have some humility. It's a process. Most radicals were in fact liberals. And I've always argued, Tim, that it was it was the the honest liberals who ended up uh going to the next level, the next stage, you know, because they were able to transcend their uh their their class, their class positions, their their class uh, uh privileges. Uh they understood that uh, ultimately you have to have radical change in this country if we had a, a, a prayer to try to address the issues of, of collective humanity. So, you know, keep that in mind. Remember when you were unconscious, when you thought certain things, you know? So, you know, your responsibility as a newfound radical is to help other people to deal with these kinds of questions. Not to look down your nose, but, you know, we have in this culture this tendency toward elitism. And it's a constant struggle we have to engage in. And again, we don't even confront the elitists in an uh, antagonistic way. We struggle with people. You see, as organizers, we have to, we remind ourselves that there's no such, that this process is a process of development, okay? And you, we, we, we stress over and over again to young organizers, you gotta have two things if you're gonna be an effective organizer. Uh, patience, and a real love for the people, okay? Because organizing is 80% human skills, right? So don't 
be frustrated because you you run into someone and they've been infected with all of the the bourgeois ideas that you are exposed to in this kind of backward culture. Okay, so a uh, Peter Dow, you know, you have to take someone by their by what they say and then what they start doing. So if he says that he is recognized, he said it that he was basically a Democrat Party thug and enforcer. Uh, but he's moved away from that. He recognizes certain things uh, and that's manifested in work that he's doing. Like when he got with the uh, Miriam Williams' campaign, you know, liberal, but liberal kind of ra uh, radical kind of thing. And now wanting to uh, work on this Cornell West campaign, you know, you know, you know, I, you, get, you take someone at, at, at their word and you watch, but you watch them. I think the other part of that too was that people who don't know much about this campaign stuff, they put too much um, emphasis on like a campaign manager. And there's a weird kind of race thing involved in that too. Ain't nobody gonna be telling Cornell West and his wife what to do, okay? This is their campaign, okay? This notion of some smart white folks coming in and taking over is absolutely ridiculous. But if you don't know, Black folks and sophisticated Black folks, and you got your own sort of white supremacist biases, then you might think that could be a possibility. But no, uh, a campaign manager is more a technician than anything else. Okay. So that was part of it. So I had two sort of audiences in those in those comments. Yeah. And I, I recognize that um, the majority of my Black viewers didn't really have a problem. They were like, okay. Never white guy. They, they didn't really know him. They didn't really care. They want to know what the policies were. They yeah. want to know what's Dr. Corner West going to do. Does he support reparations? Does he support uh, a, a crime bill, a hate crime bill for black folks? Like, what, is, what does he support, Tim? You know, we, we love him. But, you know, the last thing they was worried about was some guy who's planning what route he's going to take when he hits, you know, the, the speaker circuit or when he's going down to make rallies. Like, that was like the last thing they were concerned with. But for other people, that was like, all they were concerned with it was like the only thing was it was like what did he do 20 years ago and remember this tweet he sent out that time you know and i'm like why are we you know so i'm, and, I'm and, glad and peter peter will peter peter will want to correct you say he's not white he's lebanese he told so. that, brother that's the first thing he said to me when he called me mm -hmm. so when we arranged the interview i got a he, he called and and uh, he said first of all tim i'm lebanese i'm not white <laughs> <laughs> I was like, hey, man, I don't got time to put white people in little groups, man. I, I don't got time for that. I'm a brother from D.C., man. You, you, Okay, you what you look like. You know what I'm saying? That's, you know, uh, but but I respect that. You know, I, I didn't know there was a difference, but I respect it. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, yeah, it, it, it's a very interesting phenomenon. And I think that, uh, you know, we're going to see how this thing unfolds. Yeah. You know? But, uh, it, it, again, to your question, you know, um, I don't have any. Um, I don't have any any doubts that uh, Cornell is in it to go all the way, uh, and and to, to and to respond to that building process you referred to in terms of 2016 and then 2020 and today. Yeah. I think you're absolutely right that when we raised up the issue of a of a Green New Deal in 2016, we understood the potential of it. We didn't get the play that it could it could have and should have gotten. Okay. And you might recall that as soon as 2016 was over and, and AOC emerged, took that notion of a Green New Deal, uh, it took off. Because once people were exposed to it, even though they, they, they dismantled some of the most important elements of it, but the idea uh, of, a, of that being sort of part of a transitional program, it took off and we understood that. And then you look at 2020 by the time Howie ran and the politics within the Green Party was shifting even more to the left, in, at least in terms of domestic politics, you know, that we talked about in, in 2016, uh, the need to break up the banks, okay? Uh, the need to, to control the energy companies. By 2020 and now 2024, the position is, uh, we don't need to break up the banks, we need to seize the banks. That are we going to deal effectively with the issue of climate change and the role that these energy companies are engaged in, we've got to seize nationalize these companies and have them uh, being run democratically by the people in those companies and coming up with a program of a just transition 
transforming those energy companies so that they are, in fact, not impediments to uh, dealing with the issue of, or the necessity of building renewable energy, uh, but what will help facilitate that process. So the politics are shifting, and therefore the Cornell West campaign, if that's the foundation it has to uh, operate from. You can't you can't win. And remember now, he's not the Dem, he's not the, the Green Party uh, nominee yet. He has to win that, mm -hmm. and so. And people have to understand that. And folks in the Green Party, you know, they're just they're not just going to turn this over to anybody. So, you know, he understands that. His campaign understands that. And they're moving to make sure that uh, there's a consolidated base of support uh, and that the ideas of the campaign are in alignment with the overall values and perspectives uh, of the Green Party. And so this whole notion of, 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 of eco-socialism has to be back on the table and that's these are some of the things that have to be debated and will be discussed mm. i'm glad you brought that up i'm glad you brought that up I, I noticed that there was a tweet out there about um biden and trump and a lot of focus a lot of focus by mainstream media and corporate news is that oh corner what's going to be a spoiler well i'm looking at these numbers of biden versus trump and um corner what's got nothing to do with you being down 10 points I see Trump up 10 points in some places against Joe Biden, and they don't even have Cornel West factored into all these polls yet. Exactly. How was how that looking to you? Are they already claiming Russia, 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 China? Well, you know, they started that last week. Um, as soon as those polls came out, they, they indicated that that separation taking place between Trump and Biden. But then the question becomes, uh, again, where is the evidence and what could the Russians be doing to, that, that could result in this kind of separation. It's quite clear that Democrats have done everything they can do to try to undermine the Trump administration, the Trump uh, uh, candidacy. In fact, some people might argue that it was this, this constant um, uh, attempt to undermine Trump that had the opposite effect, that there is e there's even some sympathy, even among independents, that the uh, uh, Democrats have, have gone over the line. They have weaponized the law to basically undermine a potential uh, um, um, oppositional uh, candidate. True or not, doesn't really matter sometimes. It's a perception, okay? And so they have done everything they could do to undermine Trump, uh, but it, it uh, continues to separate. So what is the question? What is the issue? What are the issues that he's dealing with? And, uh, and, and when you look at his rhetoric, beyond some of the, the more uh, outrageous uh, and racist uh, commentary about, uh, you know, same thing with the immigrants and all of that, he has this, this line on the, on the economy and the, and the working class. Now, the Democrats, they don't have the, the political line uh, to be able to dismantle Trump's phony positions on the working class. Because to dismantle that, you have to take a alternative class perspective, okay? They're afraid to do that because right now they're controlled by the neoliberal internationalists or what the Trump people will refer to as the globalists. Big capital, big monopoly capital. That's who controls the, the Democrat party, okay? So when you have that kind of control, you don't, you give, um, you give a nod to so, to the to workers, but you really don't pursue working class interests. Right. You talk about Biden being a, a friend of labor, but he 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 negotiated away something as simple as paid leave during the uh, uh, struggle with the uh, the bosses at the at the uh, uh, the rail railway uh, uh, industry. Okay, so you know it's phony. But Cornell West, even Bernie Sanders before he surrendered. They have the perspective, the language that can help to sharpen those real contradictions that can show that you've got to put the focus on the economy and the ruling class and the shortcomings of this capitalist system. It's the system, not some immigrant uh, 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 workers desperate trying to get into the U.S. in order to, to pay, in order to support their families, but it's the system that's creating those people who are compelled to leave. It is the capitalist system that's developing, that's driving everybody's wages down. 
is the capitalism that's responsible for the fact that uh, working class people have not experienced an uh, increase in, in real wages in fi almost 50 years now, okay? So when Trump with his, his, his divisive, can I cuss? I can't remember. Yes, you can, yeah. When Trump and his devices bullshit, you know, trying to uh, re-divert attention away from the system to individuals, the Democrats they don't have any any response to that. A a Cornell West campaign and other campaigns that are raising the questions of 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 class and capitalism and the connection with that and racism and gender oppression. This is what is going to start resonating uh, with the public. Okay. And so the Democrats are in a, a real uh, predicament because, you know, they don't have that perspective. They don't have that line and it is undermining them. Look, they have not been able to win back the nine million white workers that had voted for, um, they had voted for uh, uh, Barack Obama, mm -hmm. um, it, but then voted for, uh, for, for, for the uh, Republicans, in, I mean, uh, Trump in 2016, yep. you know? That they 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 lost those nine million people, and couldn't get haven't been able to get them back. Why? So you know the the, the real and the real play here is going to be uh, uh, with the working class, with the independents, and when they start factoring in this West this West issue. Because look, Corner West campaign, they have never had one rally yet. They've never had one major fundraiser. Right. Okay. Now when that starts off. Look at what happened with Bernie Sanders. I remember when people in, in the Sanders campaign were contacting some of us when Sanders was at three three percent, and I had friends of mine tell me, "Well, you know, what's the Sanders thing?" I said, "It's going to take off. It's going to take off," and it took off. Okay. So, uh, hold on a second. No problem. Sorry about that. No, no good. My my son came in from school. Hope he saw my sign, my on air sign. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, it's a point. It, I, the point I'd like to to mention is you just said it is uh the Democrats don't really have a response. They don't have a retort to to Donald Trump in any substantive way because in order to retort it, they got to kind of move to the left, and that's the last thing their donors want them to do is exactly. move to the left. Uh, and, and actually fight for workers. I, I just put, this is perfect. I just put out some content last night to that effect. Like, come on guys, Joe Biden, if he wanted to shut this thing down, he got a pin. And, and Cornel West, Dr. Wesson said this himself. If the man thinks I'm a threat, uh, throw some cold water on me by doing something for the people. But see, he wants to do the absolute least amount Right. And even that's too much for him to want to do. He don't even want to do that. He don't even want to do the least amount. So instead, they're going to try to ignore him. Do you think that Trump's, the charges against Trump, do you think those are politically motivated? Well, <clears throat> um, quite frankly, I do, yes. But basically, there was none, none of those charges that had to be uh, objectively uh, pursued. That basically... Uh, while there, there's been all, it's all kind of criminality that folks are involved in. Yeah. And there are, these are decisions made by prosecutors, uh, by legal agencies. Okay. The dispute with the, with the documents, you know, does anybody really believe that if there was a dispute between, uh, the, the, uh, archives folks and, uh, Barack Obama or, or Joe Biden, that it would have resulted in an FBI raid at the House? I don't think so. The situation in Georgia with uh, Trump uh, telling his Republican uh, folks in, in, in Georgia, hey, look, I, I, we need to find 11,000 votes. Does that mean commit fraud? You know, it, all these are interpretations, you know. Um, this thing in, in, in New York, I mean, look, so the, the objective reality is that it's perceived by many people as a misuse of, of power, okay? And that has played, I think, to the detriment uh, of the Democrats. In fact, as I said earlier, I think it's blown back on them uh, that people perceive these to be uh, politically charged uh, cases. Even the whole uh, January 6th dust up. The notion of, of trying to make a connection between 
uh, Trump's rhetoric and the actions of some people at the Capitol, that 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 that's a that's that's a stretch. You know, many people, some people believe that in the end, if these things go to trial, he's going to beat them. But what's being used now is the fact that he's he's been charged, you know, uh, with felonies. And in the sort of bubble that Democrats operate in, they believe that that was enough to to uh, to generate some some real uh, 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 opposition. But you know, these folks, the, the arrogance of these these Democrats is incredible. They really believe that that their perspective, their view of the world is in fact the only one. And anybody who disagrees with that, either they are, are the enemy or they're just, uh, uh, what did Hillary Clinton, uh, Clinton call them, deplorables. And that's why they can't, that's why they are losing and will lose. And we'll probably will, might lose, but whoever they might uh, replace Biden with. That's a real possibility. I believe that Biden in the end is not gonna run. Now remember now, we still in 2023. And for him to indicate he's not going to run would make him an, an, an instant lame duck. Okay, they can't do that. But I don't see them in 2024 actually seriously uh, fielding uh, um, an individual who clearly does not have the stamina uh, to in, to endure a the the rigors of a real campaign in 2024. I don't believe that's going to happen myself. So. What I'm saying is that, and this is a long-winded response, <clears throat> with the possibility of this no labels um, movement, these, these rich people have gotten together, they're gonna run a, 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 a third or fourth party candidate also. And that that movement is going to, you're going to tie into or take away some potential support for Trump supporters. This is gonna be the event, the, the attempt to win over the centrist Republicans and centrist Democrats, okay? With these various elements in contention, what is happening, Tim, this might sound kind of outrageous. What is happening is a potential path for a third party candidacy like uh, or Cornell West, okay? Uh, a, with, a, with a plurality of the votes. So unlike people saying, oh, it'd be a success if they win 5%. I don't think people are thinking like that today. I think people are thinking in terms of how do we win this? Okay. The, all the conditions seem to be converging. There's not naivete to, to suggest that. That with that no labels, the, the, the revulsion against Trump uh, and the Democrats, uh, that historically the people might be willing to take a chance uh, with a New radical direction represented in the in the in the the person of of a Cornell West and a Cornell West campaign and the Green Party. Yes, yes, that's that's exactly how I see it. This opportunity, brother, just seems to be it's perfect. Well, I don't know if I could say perfect, but <clears throat> it's a very promising time right now. I think opportunistic time for for this to be happening, for this to be going down. I we got Trump people. You know, either really like him or really can't stand him, and you got Biden and people. Seventy percent of America don't even think the guy should run regardless of what his policies are. They just don't want him because he just passed it. He then he's cognitively diminished to such a degree that people just don't feel comfortable with him being in that leadership slot, even though we know it's mostly just you know uh, for show. But he's um, not running the country. Everybody yeah, knows that he's yeah. not running the country. I'm surprised he could run the, the lawnmower. You know, he's, but you know, there's something, you brought up AOC earlier and, and it was something I saw about that in, in my own progression of feeling about her, man. Um, there was a time when I defended her. You know, I was, I think I caught a lot of flack because I was unwilling to throw her under the bus a couple of years ago because I feel, hey, she's young. I mean, she's the age of my daughter. Um, and, well, she know it, but she didn't have any political experience. And she's going in there with these vipers. And, you know, every once in a while she'll say things, that, you know, and I, they'll resonate with me. And then other times it was like, I don't know where she was coming from. But um, when did it become? I think now it's more apparent that she has folded into the Democratic Empire. When for you did you kind of accept? I don't know what your trajectory has been. Let me just put that to you. 
what has been your progression or what are your thoughts about AOC and her, the recent developments? Tim, I'm, I was like, I'm, I'm, I was with you as, as an organizer. Um, you know, I can't take these positions that these uh, uh, folks take that haven't organized anybody. I know nothing about how you build movement uh, who pretend that they can project into the future how someone will evolve uh, and who take this this position where they just don't deal with electoral politics because they're so revolutionary. So when when she emerged, same thing. She's younger than some than, than uh, you know my oldest daughters, twenty eight years old, uh, still in development. And so I couldn't start off by you know uh, uh, condemning her. I said, give the young woman a chance. Let's see how she evolves. I get slack too. You know, but I don't give a fuck because, you know, basically <laughs> this is what I do, you know, and, and so I'm, I'm, you know, I'm an elder, you know, I know I got a sense of how you have to do this politics and how things unfold and, you know, so, you know, so yeah, I got some slack, but uh, it became, when it became clear that because of the, the fact that there was no movement, you see, people have to understand that when you go into this, like you said, when you go into, when you start swimming with these sharks, if you don't have accountability, if you don't have folks who that can mentor you to help you to avoid some of the traps, uh, to avoid getting sucked in, if your own ideas are still evolving, your own ideological development is still, you know, is still developing, if you will, if you use frame it like that, then it's easy then to get sucked into this thing. I mean, you become an overnight star, you're on the, the David Letterman show and all of this. And it's easy to get get sucked in, right? So over a while, you know, then it was, became clear that she wasn't going to be able to hold the line with progressive politics because even her own mind what was progressive or radical was a little bit fuzzy, okay? And so I think that as a consequence, I think the progressive movement uh, basically lost her, right? And now she's thinking in, in careerist terms. Because uh, you got these these idiots who you know talking about well you know one day she's going to run for president for what yeah. what does she bring to the table that's different right. okay right. so again for me the the explanation for why many of these folks turn out to be just uh, opportunist criminals is not just them but we have to look at ourselves too right. we have this, this movement is so we have it's such incredibly weak movements and organizations. So that now you have armchair folks who just, you know, pontificating stuff. And that's really about it. We need that, of course, if you're talking about something, you know, but because there's no accountability structures, then these folks we lose. Look at some of the folks in the so-called squad. Same kind of phenomenon. We tried to, uh, at the Black, Black Alliance of Peace, we tried to work with a couple of these uh, folks and we had meetings and work with them. But what happens? They come in to they hire these pimps who work in DC, who have this narrow and conservative view to how you do politics. And they become their chiefs of staff and everything else. And they 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 are kind of already kind of you know a little shaky. Does that mean that they can't the new new candidates? And they get sucked into a, like a a, 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 pragma, a pragmatism that even though you might have some radical views, you know, you, we need to be pragmatic. What can you really do? You know, and so they, they give up and surrender their principles and their views in order to be pragmatic. And what happens is you end up being just another opportunist. So, you know, there's no progressive thought. There's no radical thought. Look, you, you've been around long enough to remember back in the 1970s, the, the uh, Congressional Black Caucus, they were, in fact, the conscious of the Congress. You had you have some black radicals in that. OK, people got to remember if they don't know that when the state went after uh, Angela Davis, hmm. a communist, a black communist who was charged with terroristic charges, there was massive support in the Congressional Black Caucus and among all of the emerging uh, black politicians. Nobody wasn't scared back in those days. Now you got uh, Omala Yeshatilla from the African People's Socialist Party, 81 years old, facing the possibility of prison because they oppose U.S. policies in Ukraine. You can't get these Negroes to, to, to utter a peep on that. Mm. These are real chumps, okay? 
So that shows you how far to the right politics has gone. So it is the lack of accountability that we are uh, we not we're unable to impose that allow these folks to uh, to surrender to their own internal opportunism. So I criticize them. I criticize us. I give us a little bit of a break because we didn't just evolve like this. What we are today in terms of a radical movement is as a consequence of a what uh, Pascal Roberts referred to refers to as a 50 year counter revolutionary process. That the, 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 the state decided in the 1970s, they were never going to allow another generation that emerged in the 60s and, and 70s to emerge again. And so it was a con concerted effort to undermine radical politics, to undermine the leading edge of radical politics, which is the Black Liberation Movement. And you got we got to say this too, Tim. We got young white folks who they don't have a clue. They actually think that their little multinational uh, organizations, uh, uh, with their emphasis on the white proletariat, that they're actually going to run something, that they're going to make revolution in the U.S. No, you're not. If this process is not, not, is not uh, led by African people, Black people in this country, it ain't going nowhere, okay? So the enemy understood that. And that's why they systematically tried to dismantle our organizations, okay? And that's why we had this emergence of the, 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 the phenomenon of the, uh, of the Black American with an emphasis on America. That's why you today you get Negroes talking about uh, how concerned they are about Putin and Xi and, 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 and in China. I'm like, what have they done to you, Negro? When you look in that in your rear view mirror and see those blue lights, I bet you a dollar to a donut, the, the okay, I might go too far. The, the officer <laughs> who gets out that car mm -hmm. is not going to be Chinese, yeah. Iranian, Russian. Nope. They're going to be a homegrown US citizen. They might be white or black, or black. And you still might end up being brutalized like your brother in Memphis who got his ass whooped, beat to death. Right. Five black criminals. Yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, um, that's why I'm, you know, I'm looking at this class race thing and I'm realizing how there's really a separation within the black community on this. And, you know, you got those guys down at the CBC. I saw you, <laughs> brother, I read your, uh, I read your tweet or something you wrote, man, about something you wrote about the CBC and them getting together to have a, a mixer <laughs> and they, they didn't care about our uh, issues they care more about line dancing it's i don't even want to say it because it was that it was hilarious i'm i'm not doing it justice something about dancing with with Annie maxi maxine or something um but i realize now that the black the black working folks the black folks that are the, of the hurting class shout out to reset race podcast those folks are totally different than these these uh upper middle class, well-to-do black folks who are disconnected from the real struggle. And those are the ones who get the, they get the, they're the ones who get on MSNBC and CNN. They're the ones who get an opportunity to be the face of black America when they don't represent real black issues, the, the what black people are really going through. And I tell people, I say, look, man, I'm good for you. Barack is good for you because we don't want nothing. Like I, I don't have no dreams, bruh. And what I mean by that is, I don't want, nor expect, nor am I looking for a CNN slot, or an MSNBC show, NBC show, or a, C or a CBS show. All I want to do is grow what I'm doing now and reach more people with my message. That's it. And you don't know how rare that is. What people's goals are when it comes to careerism, careerism, and where they where they see themselves. Bro, I have no aspirations, man. If if I'm lucky, if I'm fortunate, if health holds help health, health holds up, I want to be doing this ten years from now and still have a job on the show, just have more people watching us. That's all I'm trying to do. So there's, a, I, there's I, a, go ahead, brother. No, no, I appreciate that. You're right. I mean, I, I salute you because you have been consistent. And you're right. They can't they can't corrupt you when you are clear about who you are, uh, and what and what kind of service you're trying to provide to the people. You can't be corrupted. What are they gonna come to you with? You know, what are they gonna come to me with? You're gonna give me some money? I don't need no money. I don't need no money, you know? <laughs> I'm trying to, I'm trying to be nice. Right, right. You know, well, so, I can't say I don't need no money, but
but if I got to do something for it, exactly, you know, I, I got to do I something. So you, you can't, you can't buy me. Right. There you, know? you go. There you go. You know, and so that is what, and that's the example we have to have for our people. That basically is about service. All the Africans that came before us, you know, they served our people. They didn't make money. They didn't. They, they didn't get. Uh, 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 they weren't uh, in the in the history books necessarily. What made the movement were the soldiers, the people, to hit the ground, who were doing the work, doing knocking on the doors and all that. We've got to we raise them up more than we do. We get we sometimes we get fixated on the on the personalities, you know, they get raised up. Some of them are good, you know, but people have to understand what makes movement, what makes effective opposition. It's not the stars. It is in fact the people themselves, is the, the, the average, ordinary, everyday folks who sacrifice, who go to work and they come home, but before they go and, and take care of their family, they go to the community meeting. That's why the way I was organized, the way I was trained was when you have uh, uh, meetings in the evening, one hour, 15 minutes, Tim, max, because you got primarily women, 75%, uh, and the brothers, they they'll get, they'll participate when you organize the event, so they'll come and help set up and all of that. But in terms of being in the meetings, it's going to be 70, 75 uh, percent women. They come to the meetings. They don't have time to be sitting around watching some uh, petty bourgeois individuals, you know, sit around and pontificate. You come in, you have your business meeting, hour fifteen minutes, they release because they, they got to go to that second job. They got to go, go home and cook and get the kids ready and all of that, okay? So, you know, this is this is the base of, of, of movement building that we've kind of lost. And, and so we say, you know, that this is about us getting back to the basis. basics. It's about understanding what we have to do. It's about people understanding we all have to sacrifice if we have this vision of what it means to be to be free. I want to see freedom. I want to see our people and all people being able to live free, to not have to be worried about, you know, getting sick, to, to have situations where we don't see what we see in some of these major cities. We have blocks and blocks of people who are, who are without houses, who are homeless, okay? Well, we have equal education among, among the people, and that where you, you can go to the private sector and get something that's so-called superior, you know? These are basic things that everybody has a right, for example, to leisure. You know, my, my brother just had to start working. He was working 80 hours a, a week, two jobs to do what? Just to pay bills. How do you live when you're working 80 hours a week? You know, and so many people wouldn't like that. So that, that's not living, but that's, that's slavery. But that's what capitalism is. It is modern day slavery. And that's why that's why I'm a socialist. That basically we're not going to address the the needs of of people until we have a new kind of system, and we can't we're not going to sneak up and and develop that system. I'm saying that our language today has to be straight up explicit, and people cannot be scared, you know, to say that they are socialist, communist, or whatever, you know. And that's why I'm saying it clear up, straight up, over and over again. I'm a decolonial uh, pan-Africanist communist, okay? Until we have a new system, uh, then basically it's going to be a, a continuation of this thing, this barbarism that they call a uh, normal uh, life in the U.S., Western Europe, and throughout the world. You shut it down, Ajamu. As always, brother, as always. Um, where should people go to find out more about the Black Alliance for Peace? And whatever whatever type of links or announcements you'd like to make. Please go to the Black Alliance of Peace dot com. We are right now in a fundraiser because we don't have money. We don't get uh, no. Of course, can you, you hear what we're saying? No, ain't no foundation going to give us no money. OK, uh, so we depend on the people. So go to Black Alliance of Peace. You can check out our website. All, and I would really urge you to read the stuff, okay? There's no other analysis like that. But also give us some, some, some money. We need some resource, okay? Also, too, don't forget, a Black Agenda Report, if you're trying to understand the world um, and from different perspectives, but, but grounded in a Black radical perspective, blackagendareport.com, okay? And then I'm, my, I'm getting my website together, uh, and I'm going to start writing some more a little bit uh, soon. Uh, but that's what we do. We're still working, still trying to build, 
And again, we salute you, Brother Tim, for uh, your consistency. Uh, and we say, keep up the good work. Uh, and we're going to see you on, on the other side of freedom. Absolutely, my brother. But that's it, folks. Ajama Baraka, you know who he, know how to reach him. <clears throat> Excuse me. Please reach out to him. Support the, support the cause of the Black Alliance for Peace and uh, follow his works. He's a great brother. He makes me want to be a better brother. Every time I talk to him, I learn something. That's why I shut up when he's talking so I can take it all in. We need to, we need to all realize uh, there's something to be, to be gleaned from uh, his words and his, uh, his expertise. That's it, y'all. I'll see you guys on the next one. You know where to find me. Uh, go to Tim at TimBlackTV.com. Go to WatchTimBlackTV.com. Join TimBlack.com to become a member. And I appreciate y'all. Until next time, don't let nobody take your cornbread in. Why are you supporting Dr. Cornell West? Man, it's a new day. Where you been? End.